it sounds like some of the research that you've been doing as well is what's called often weird morality of Western educated intellectual rich and democratic um, that a lot of the research is done by and for people as in, in part of that community. And that's just sort of an assumption of that's how the world is um, versus in, in different places. I'm thinking, you know, you've mentioned Turkey, but I'm also thinking about, um, I think was it the research of, of Iceland or, or, uh, or Denmark or one of the Scandinavian countries of having a lot of happiness and, and, and connection there. They're, they're atheistic, they tend to be more atheistic, but they also tend to be very similar um, culturally. So, so it's not the religion there, but it's a different culture. And again, there's a, they're, they're very dense social networks there versus I think in America and a lot of Western Europe, there's a, a lot more of an individuality that's, that's, that's there. Um, I'm just curious if, that's, if, if that is something that you've noticed or, or if that's an accurate statement. Yeah, I think that uh, we're definitely looking at the, the weird phenomenon. That's um, Western educated and industrialized oh, industrial. democratic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that, that phrase comes from Joseph Henrik and his colleagues at the University of British Columbia. It's this idea that this small segment of the world, Western Europe and North America, it tends to be much more individualistic and more analytically minded than the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, one of the things that um, I think that's attributable to uh, which I don't know if I don't know if other the researchers who really do the weird um, studies like Joe Henrik and other these guys I don't know if they've published anything on this um, Jonathan might know but really it's a legacy of Protestantism I mean this all, the, the areas that are super weird um, in that acronym they're all Protestant mm -hmm. uh, historically Western Europe right like Northwestern Europe where the trading cultures had sort of a different um, a different cultural context and a need than Southern Europe, and that sort of helped exacerbate the splits between Catholic Europe, Catholic Europe and Protestant Europe. And then North America, which was colonized, uh, well, was colonized by France and, and England, but you know, eventually was sort of taken over by England this, in this um, post-Protestant era. It's, it's an individualistic version of Christianity. Mm -hmm. It's a less ritualistic version, right? That's one of the main points of, um, of Protestantism was, was famously, uh, especially in the Reformed tradition, the thinkers who instituted Protestantism downplayed the importance of sacraments like communion, like merit, like weddings and marriages, like um, um, last rites. So, in the Catholic version of Christianity and the Orthodox version, there are seven sacraments. Mm -hmm. um, in Protestantism, even in Lutheranism, which, which did the least tweaking, there were, there's only two. There's only um, uh, baptism and communion. And that de-ritualization of Christianity, um, if you think back to our talk about institutional thinking and, um, and the acceptance of authority and affiliation, the less ritual you have in your your religious and social environment, um, the less reinforcement you're going to get for the worldview, for the the set of norms, the expectations, and for the the close social density, right? Like the Catholic countries of Southern Europe are known as being more collectivistic, not in a, not in a Marxist sense, but in a, in a specific psychological sense, which, which means that they're very uh, closely densely knit together right think about like an italian immigrant neighborhood in new york city in mm -hmm. the 1920s everybody knows everybody and everybody shoulders each other's burdens and gossips about one another and goes to the same church right um protestantism sort of loosened that knot and didn't get rid of it because we we humans need that knot but it, it loosened it and i think that that weird phenomenon that we're looking at now is in part a sort of historical legacy of, of that change to the ritual landscape of the West. Yeah, and 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 how the you know we 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 often don't think about how immersed we are in a particular culture until we look at it from the outside. 
uh, this is a different guy. Like, what we do is what we do is the right way, the right thing, and everyone else does it weird. Weird with a lowercase, lowercase weirds there. Um, I want to give you a, a chance for any last thoughts or or other pieces that you want to share about this really fascinating work that you're doing. You know, this chapter was an effort of summarizing a lot of the theory and trying to bring different pieces of research that were sort of tangential, but bring them directly to bear on this relationship between intuitive thinking and religious belief. Um, but it was still pretty theoretical. So right now, Connor and I are in the midst of collecting data and, and beginning to analyze it. And so actually trying to bring some empirical work to bear on this, because I think so far, the empirical studies that have been done sort of point to this important role of social cognition and social relationships within the broader relationship between cognitive style and religiosity. Um, so we're trying to bring some new evidence to bear on that and directly to see how it is that this embeddedness within socially dense communities impacts that association. And I think our hope is that that provides sort of the crucial factor so that as we go and are comparing different cultures and social contexts, researchers can be attuned to that as an important variable that's gonna change which way this association goes and where we should expect it to hold or not hold. Connor? Yeah, that's, so that's, that's the one thing I wanted to mention, which was this project that Jonathan and I have going on also with um, John Shaver from the University of Otago. So there's, there's a, a kind of group of us who are, are pursuing a, a related um, number of tracks down this path together. Um, we actually, I think, just finished collecting data. Is that right, Jonathan? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I've, I've been away on my honeymoon, so I've been out of contact in the desert for a while. Um, but I think, so now we have a bunch of data that we pre-registered, uh, which is a new practice in the social sciences where you say you go online and you list exactly which analyses you're going to do on the data before you even collect it oh wow so that when you when you um do the analyses you don't get to kind of like tweak it or look for another connection or do what they call p hacking which is looking for significant correlations by looking at all the connections you can and things like that um and where that project is looking at the relationship between uh, holistic and and uh, analytical thinking and religiosity, especially uh, the social dimensions of it, um, to to apply that social foundations hypothesis to um, real world self report data, you know. And uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. So um, so. You know, I think that's one last thing that I, well, actually two last things that I wanted to mention is from our chapter, we also draw on the work of a psychologist from Yale named David Rand and his, um, his workers. He's actually a colleague of Gordon Pennycook who edited the book and shepherded us through the publication process. Um, David, David's work uh, at Rand has found some pretty interesting correlations between analytical thinking and uh, cooperation, namely that analytical thinking seems to make people a little more transactional in the way that they deal with cooperation. So when you're, um, if you're cooperating in a little group where you're all gonna see each other again, day in and day out, it makes a lot of sense to cooperate because if I don't cooperate with you today, then tomorrow you're not gonna cooperate with me and then you know, we both hurt. But if it's just a one-off scenario, like I'm visiting your, your big city for one day and I buy a, something from you at your store and I'm never gonna see you again and you're never gonna see me again, then uh, in a purely rational format, uh, it would make sense for me to try and cheat you and vice versa because we're never gonna see each other again and there's no danger of losing a potential beneficial relationship down the road. Well, um, the work that, uh, David Rand and others have done at Yale, seems to show that analytical thinking makes people a little more likely to choose that defection uh, option in the context where it makes sense. Uh, and I don't mean that in a moral sense, I mean that in a, you know, just been, a transactional sense. 
Um, whereas intuitive thinkers or intuitive thinking seems to be associated with choosing the cooperative uh, option, regardless of whether it benefits the doer, the, the agent at that particular time. So one of the conclusions we suggested in our chapter is that in, uh, religious beliefs, because they are tethered to intuitive um, acceptance of a social norm, of, a, of a, the, the beliefs that are instituted by authorities that we accept, they also are a fairly credible signal that the person who espouses them is, is not going to defect on cooperative expectations opportunistically. That is, that somebody who's very, seems very devout and very much believes in whatever religious system, you know, you're talking about, they're probably also not going, they don't, so they're, they're showing by definition that they don't question the authority of the, the right. social, right? So that means that it's pretty likely that they're also not going to question the cooperative expectations mm -hmm. that come with that, right? Like, I'm not, go, I'm going to pay the tithe. I'm going to um, offer my home to guests if that's what's expected. If it's not, then I won't, right? Like, we're not saying that religious people are better morally. We're saying that they're more likely to just follow the social norms without questioning. Mm -hmm. And that can be good or bad, depending on what the norms are. But it's just an important aspect of this theory that we've put together, or this hypothesis. Well, what's, what's interesting, and, and thank you both for, for taking the time to talk, that what's, what's fascinating about a lot of the research that you're doing is obviously using the analytic elements to understand a lot of the intuitive questions because you've got to be analytic to be able to be a good scientist but looking at questions of religion um from a a social perspective uh, because a lot of the religion and science discussion as i know both of you know um is trying to prove why religion is useless or worthless or why there's no god and and the work that you're doing i think is is designed to be here's what the good science is going to say and, and religious communities can use this or not, um, but, it's, but it's really interesting and valuable data for us to be able to explore anyone who is a, identifies as a religious person or a religious leader to be able to say, what, is, what does this data mean about the community that I'm, I'm a part of and how do I build a sense of trust and connection and, and community as we all try to balance what does it mean to be an individual as a, an individual who's also a part of a society? Where do we where do we draw that balance? And it's not that there's necessarily always the right, wrong conversation, but when is it going to be appropriate to be pushed in one direction or the other? And, and the research that you're doing is really helping us shed, shed a lot of light on that dynamic. So thank you both for the fascinating work you're doing and taking some time to talk this, this morning. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. It's always fun.